And it's FTX. It's a safe and easy way to get into crypto. Yeah, I don't think so. And I'm never wrong about this stuff. Never. Big advocate for Sam because he has two parents that are compliance lawyers. If there's ever a place I could be that I'm not going to get in trouble, it's going to be at FTX. Listen, not every bad actor in the investment world is equally as bad as these people at FTX are, nor is every fraud equally as fraudulent as FTX has been. And naturally, not every safe investment strategy is equally safe. This leads us to our hierarchy of frauds, from least offensive to most egregious. Now, personal finance is inherently personal, and I am not a certified financial advisor. So take this more as my observations of the world, instead of my advice to you as an individual. Starting off with our least fraudulent category, E-tier. These are all considered safe in some regard, but we can still give a relative rating between these strategies and how they might apply to the random investor. First, we have the classic 60-40 strategy. And of course, this depends on factors like time to retirement and risk appetites. Like for people that are younger, it might be 100% stocks. Um, this generally matches the market with low-cost index funds. This is what everyone's default should be, no questions asked. Secondly, we have Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Now, in principle, tips are great. However, just like normal bonds, they fall prey to higher than reported inflation, since the government has a systemic reason to re underreport inflation concerns. And since these naturally have no stock exposure, realistically, this purchasing power will just be eaten away by the true inflation rate, assuming you even have positive yields on the tips. Imagine paying money for someone else to hold your money. I would never. That was fast and simple, and next we have D-tier, overpaying for underperformance. The majority of hedge funds underperform the market, and maybe you think you can find the few that will outperform, but since managers at hedge funds are on average changing every two years, it's hard to find a hedge fund with a lasting enduring advantage. And statistically speaking, you're probably better off in a 60-40 or some ratio. Now, worse than just general hedge funds are high fee funds. It's one thing to buy a hedge fund that's likely to underperform or at best match the market. And it's another thing to buy that same or a very similar fund with a 3% expense ratio. This is a recipe for long-term value destruction. On a related note here, we have investment managers. These are of course more for high wealth individuals, but the principle remains the same. These managers, just like hedge fund managers, are largely reviewed quarter to quarter, if not more frequently. This short-term evaluation precludes managers from having the necessary time to outperform if they even were going to outperform in the first place. Even though there's a large amount of managers who will outperform over any given period, you can't just know who those managers are before you end up picking your own manager. Still, largely speaking, you're going to be overpaying for underperformance, as these fees can stack up quite fast. The theme for these D-tier investments is that the recipient of the funds and the manager is still at least plausibly acting in your best interest, regardless of the realized returns. C-tier is where this changes. Now, C-tier is focused on the beginning of bad actors. These are places where whole life insurance gets sold, annuities get sold to people that don't need it or are better off without it, and it's really hard to describe how mad the principle of selling annuities to people that don't need it makes me. Giving someone who's 65 a 6% yield on their investment and then taking all the principal when they die, when the current 30-year treasury is 4.5%, and then they could pass on that principal when they die, or just, say, withdraw more than the coupon rate of the treasury and live off the same monthly payments but still have money left over to pass on to their relatives when they die. At least there's the state guarantees, which acts in a function similar to the SIPC insurance, but for annuities. However, regardless of all this, the difference in the yields for a complete loss of capital after on average like 15 years, assuming average age of 80, and targeting the most financially vulnerable community really makes me rage. In regards to whole life, where this is abused is where whole life insurance gets sold to like 25 year olds with no family and a bunch of college debt, and the seller gets a significant commission having just advertised the cash value that's slowly building up in the contract payments. like. Seriously, someone with no dependents does not need life insurance, and someone who's that young, even if they have dependents, should undoubtedly be on term life insurance, where they have lower premiums, higher payouts over a specified time period. People past 60 probably don't need life insurance, aside from crazy situations. Most people are not financially dependent on their grandma. In the universe I live in, there's really no place for a whole life insurance policy. Just get a term life for what you need, when you need it, and invest the rest in a Roth IRA. You're going to be much better off. Finally, in this category, we have binary options. Now, th this 
this is more akin to gambling than anything else and there's not explicitly someone that's that's kind of selling you this idea of trading that'll be in a later category so just the principle of binary options is that it's going to be high fee volatile returns and i'm not going to say too much else about them because i don't know but other than that if you're not the one that's selling them you're probably going to lose money in the long run Another step up the ladder, we're on to B tier, where we inhabit the world of course sellers on TikTok and uh, crypto pumpers. This one's fairly simple. While some course sellers have legitimate value uh, and act as sort of a compilation of knowledge and expertise on a specific topic, the overwhelming vast majority are run by some hustle bro after he funnels you in through TikTok videos showing you his rented Ferrari, throwing fake money in the air, and then he directs you to his website with 50 different upsells and AI generated testimonials all to get the mean reverting trend following double head and shoulders RSI based trading strategy that hasn't passed a single back test in 20 years. And of course he knows it doesn't work because he doesn't make his money from that. He makes his money from you buying the course, not the trading himself. This segment shares aspects of the abundance lifestyle and manifesting. It's like all that stuff that's thinking like thinking hard enough about something will make it manifest in your life. It's like, okay, yeah, okay. Uh, in the end, before you pay money for a course, just look up a college course on the topic that you'd like to learn and try to find a syllabus online. Then buy all the textbooks and do the required reading in the syllabus. You're going to learn 10 times as much, you're going to pay probably 10 times less, and you're going to be smarter and uh, better read at the end of it. Just take away, do not pay for online courses. A little bit less bad than these outright TikTok course sellers are people that just post like random garbage on social media about you know, if you just make 5% per day, you'll be like a quintillionaire in two years. It's like, okay, sure, technically you're correct, but one, no one can do this. Two, it doesn't scale even if you could do it. You're going to saturate whatever market you're in until the returns are gone. And three, it promotes unrealistic investment goals, which is a more insidious uh, harm here, right? People see the abundance mindset TikToks 5% per day, and then they see the 10% average return on the stock market, and they think that either it's not worth them to invest their time in the S&P, uh, or they fall victim to future crypto scams advertising 30% per month. Or they end up not saving any money at all, preferring just to spend it all. This kind of segues us into the crypto pump and dumpers. So both people that try to advertise it and people that try to like sell access to groups saying that if you're in this Discord group, you're going to be the first to know and then you can buy before we pump it. Like, okay, in, in every case here, unless you're the one making the group selling access to others, you're going to end up just being the one that's making donations effectively to the person that's running the pump and dump scheme. Now we get more into the segment that's going to make me mad again. It's pyramid schemes that are disguised as multi-level marketing. Imagine trying to get hired at a grocery store job because like you want to pay the bills and feed your family, right? You go up to the, the, the clerk and then they tell you that they have a new employment design where you aren't technically hired, but you just go in and you buy all the goods from the store at normal retail prices with your own money. And then you go to your family and your friends and you try to sell those goods at markup. And then you get no benefits or salary from the from the employer, right? Uh, so it, it just makes me mad that people get sucked into this stuff where 90% of the downline makes virtually nothing for all the time they put in. And really the downline ends up being the true customers for the multi-level marketing. They don't, they're not really selling it in principle to other people. They care if their downline buys it. And then as long as their downline owns it, it doesn't matter if their downline offloads it to someone else. It just matters if that initial sale was made. And the next worst category that's still in the B tier, but you know, arguably could be in the A tier, is the whole timeshare investment market. And honestly, calling it an investment market is probably giving it too much credence. The important aspects of timeshare sales are the fact that it's often through high pressure, high focus sales with high fees, high maintenance costs, and extremely long contract lengths. Add to that exorbitant termination fees if they even legally allow you to exit on your own. There's a story here that I think can be a learning point. Uh, a family friend had really cheap tickets for a hotel stay, and I went with them. And what what ended up happening is they didn't read the fine print, and in the fine print you had to attend a one-hour timeshare seminar as part of your trip to this hotel. And it really comes down to they gave us $150 off the hotel ticket price in exchange for us, for at least them attending the one-hour seminar. And so the point is they wouldn't give you $150 off your ticket in exchange for the seminar if they did not expect to at least on average extract more than $150 for every person that attended that seminar. And if they're making $150 off every person that fills a seat, that really tells you the sort of margins that are involved in this business. And if those are the margins involved, those margins are coming from somewhere. The customer in this case of the timeshare is the person that provides the revenue for the business. Anyways, this rants over, timeshares and MLMs should uh, certainly be illegal. 
Now we move on into the A tier, the outright frauds. Now, while these are generally going to be widely known frauds, all of which hopefully involving significant prison time for the people involved, there are still ways by which we can parse between which fraud may be more egregious or harmful to the investment community than the others. We start off with the least of the worst outright frauds, that being SBF's involvement in FTX. Now this is the lowest of the outright frauds, and congratulations, you got clickbaited, because although he undoubtedly ruined many people's lives, he was not the worst fraudster in the investment scheme. The only mitigating factor for this fraud is that there's something to say that people probably shouldn't have all of their assets in crypto, and even more so all of their assets in crypto at the same online exchange, right? If you have a ton of, of your net worth in crypto, it should probably be in cold storage with the whole phrase, not your keys, not your crypto. And it should probably just be a few percent of anyone's portfolio, in my opinion. Now, I'm not going to go into great detail here about that Alameda firm nuking their trading account and drawing down on customer funds because th there are so many much better videos uh, about that. Just suffice it to say that people that invest in companies FDX should be very, very cautious and uh, that's really the only mitigating factor to the severity of the fraud involved here. Other than that, th there was no reason for someone to assume that FTX, out of all of the crypto exchanges, was uniquely prone to being abused by fraud. Next, we get on to Enron. This scam is, in my mind, uh, rather worse than SBF scam, not only because it was six times the scale in terms of the assets that were lost, but because it's also a publicly traded stock. Individual investors could and likely did have a lot of their portfolio individually in Enron, and at least a few employees at Enron had all of their retirement located in Enron stock, which of course subsequently went to zero. One interesting thing to note here is the fortune effect, with Enron being labeled as the most innovative company from 1996 all the way to 2001, which is the year that the company imploded. This is kind of reminiscent of the Forbes 30 under 30 effect, with Sam Bankman fried the Theranos CEO, and Martin Shkreli all being featured. Uh, but normal investors running a well-diversified portfolio should be unlikely to have been significantly impacted by Enron's destruction. It's really only people that had concentrated positions. Uh, but that ability to be concentrated positions of individual investors in the public stock market is why Enron is worse than SBF. Now we're on to the final, the worst individual fraud that uh, I think has been perpetuated in the stock market to date, at least, uh, is Bernie Madoff. The biggest and the baddest, the average lay investor could very easily have been convinced to invest in his fund with super solid annual returns. No one really knew it was a Ponzi scheme, that the volatility was non-existent almost, it was a super long track record. I could easily see myself in a different universe losing everything I owned by investing in this fund. Thankfully, it seemed... Right. Thankfully, right, yeah. It seemed that he targeted mostly charities um, as they had well-defined withdrawal cycles, limiting the risk for a run on the Ponzi scheme, meaning that the average investor wasn't the main target of the scheme, and probably the average investor wouldn't have lost everything to this man, even though many average investors certainly did lose everything to this man, if that makes sense. And just when you thought we were done, you got clickbaited again, I'm sorry. We are on to S++, the final level, the Federal Reserve. We have come full cycle the role of the central banks in financial markets. Central bank policies such as interest rate changes or quantitative easing directly affect investment strategies and market stability. The biggest effect here is that the Fed funds rate is a risk-free rate for discounted cash flow calculations. So a small change in the Fed funds rate has a drastic change in the current value of the general market. This is all fine and good until we go on a 30 minute rant arguing with ChatGPT. ChatGPT, by the way, is a strong proponent of the current measure of inflation and doesn't think that things such as the substitution effect nullify the true inflation rate as reported by the federal government. Here's an example that shows uh, the, the issue that many people seem to take with the way that the Fed measures CPI. Uh, first off, you will never see the government change a metric or method of inflation measurement that revises the measured inflation upwards. All changes of inflation measurement and the methods by which we measure inflation have been downwards historically. Shadow Stats shows the historical CPI measurements based off of the historical methods of measuring inflation. Going back to the 1990 version, if we use that method currently to measure inflation, it would be at 8%, peaking at over 12% during the, the highest of the inflation rates. And of course, the 1980s based inflation measurement method 
has the peak inflation uh, recently at over 15, near 17 percent, right? So the 1980 version has inflation at 17%. The 1990 version has inflation last year at 12%. And the current official CPI method last year has inflation at just over 9%. It's super easy to see that all revisions in the inflation measurement methodology have been downward over time. Interestingly, 1999 was a year in which they introduced the model that had the capability to process the substitution effect. To explain... According to the current CPI methodology, if last year you bought steak for $10 and this year the steak is $20, that steak, let's just say, gave you 30 units of happiness, right? The units of happiness are constant, but the prices increase. So this year, instead of paying double the price for the steak, you instead opt to pay $12 for the chicken. Let's say the chicken gives you 15 units of happiness. So now instead of paying $10 for 20 units of happiness, you're paying $12 for 15 units of happiness. Under the current CPI methodology, the rate of inflation is only 20%, when what you're experiencing is probably closer to that 100% rate of inflation because your overall enjoyment from the meat selection that you have for the same price has gone down. Now, to conclude, I'm not an economist and that's not the purpose of this video, uh, but one final thing is that if inflation is theft, then the Federal Reserve is the biggest thief that has ever existed, uh, bar none.